Welcome, everybody. Is everybody out there? I don't know. I guess everybody is. Welcome to, I guess this is the first annual virtual Rutgers alumni tasting. We're very excited to do this. I'm glad everybody could come. Thank you for joining us. I know we have a lot of people from New Jersey, uh, obviously being Rutgers, but we also have people from California, Texas, Florida, Massachusetts, Ohio, and many other states. Uh, with over 500 living alumni, Rutgers has more alumni, I think, than almost any other university in the United States. So thank you for being loyal alumni. We're uh, coming to you live from Van Nest Hall. If any of you remember it, it's on the Queens campus, the original campus of Rutgers, right off of College Avenue. And it was this building was the second constructed uh, instructional building on Rutgers campus. It was built in 19, 1845, so a little before the first game of football. Um, uh, into, I just want to introduce you to our panel right now. We have. Uh, we have Gary Pavlis joining me right now. We have Bill Heritage. We have Scott Corella, John Svella, see, and uh, what did I forget? And Charlie Thomasella, of course. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to go through. We have some wonderful wines to be tasted from New Jersey, and we're going to prove to you that New Jersey wine is for real. <laughs> so. Um, also, I want to apologize for shipping issues due to New, Jer New Jersey's archaic and prohibitionary shipping laws. We've had very bad issues with shipping, so we could only ship, that's why we had two different packages. One could only be shipped to certain states, the other could only be shipped to other states, and there were still 23 states that we couldn't ship to at all. So I apologize for people in those states if you're on, that we couldn't get you the wine, but hopefully we'll be able to find some New Jersey wine somewhere or had some of your panels, uh, your sellers. Um, uh, the paperwork you guys received, just so you know, if you're not familiar with it, I just want to go over with it. With you. you have the uh, winery, the uh, tasting notes and pairing notes for either the Thomas Hill uh, package or the Rutgers alumni package. You have an American Wine Society scoring sheet. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if you aren't, the instructions are on the back. There's also, that's for tonight's wines. Then I left a blank chart there if you wanted to score other wines. And then the Wine Folly Aroma Wheel is included. It's a very good way to discern the tastes and flavors and smells of the wines. I also included an American Wine Society brochure. I'm the regional vice president of the American Wine Society, and uh, we'd love to promote them. It's a great organization. We have uh, 10 chapters just in New Jersey alone, and then we also have um, about almost 200 cha chapters nationwide. Um, Largest wine society, consumer yes. society. Old, in oldest States. and largest yep. wine consumer wine society. Uh, for those of you who do know me, hello. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Danny Klein. Uh, like I said, I'm the regional vice president of the American Wine Society. Uh, I was a cook class of 87 originally, but like a lot of my friends and other people at Cook College back then, we liked it so much we wanted to stay around for an extra semester or two. So I actually walked with the class of 88. <laughs> but uh, uh, in college, basically, I really didn't drink too much wine. I drank beer mostly, cheap beer. And the only wines we really drank were Boone's Farm, Mad Dog, Thunderbird. Not really great wines. Uh, and I wouldn't touch them now at all. But after graduating, I started exploring the world of wine. Uh, again, starting with things like white Zinfandel and light Italian whites and then progressing my way, and over the years I've learned quite a bit about it. Um, and if you really want to know anything about me, you can always look at the web bio on the website. So, but I'm thirsty, so I wanted to get to the tasting as quick as possible. But before that, I just wanted to go and introduce you to uh, Tom Constantino. Tom, you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Danny. Hi, Tom. Tom is the uh, uh, executive director of the New Jersey uh, uh, Garden State Grape, Wine Grape Growers Association. And I just wanted for him to give a little background. There we go. A little background on the uh, history of wine in New Jersey. So. Yeah, well, um, for those of you, and, and welcome all Rutgers alumni, and I'm, I'm happy to join um, this call tonight and uh, give you just a little flavor of, of the background of New Jersey wine history. Uh, it goes back to colonial days. In fact, uh, Great Britain had challenged their colonies back when in the 1700s 
to try to make European style wine. And there were um, two landowners in New Jersey, William Alexander up in Basking Ridge and a gentleman named Edward Antill down at Piscataway, uh, close to Rutgers, who ish answered the challenge and they wind, wound up planting vineyards and, and producing grapes that were considered uh, on a par with what Great Britain was used to receiving in Europe. And, and they received awards from the London Society of the Arts and thus was born officially the New Jersey wine industry. Um, it was an industry that, that's been ongoing ever since colonial days. Prohibition basically put uh, an end to the industry just about because um, at the time there were vineyards prospering throughout the state. Uh, however, once prohibition came in, a lot of them had to close up. Uh, and then following prohibi prohibition, the way the law was written in New Jersey, only um, the only way a new winery could open is, with, is if the population increased by a million. So from 1933 up to 1981, there was largely six to seven wineries open at a given time. In fact, uh, Charlie Tomasello, Tomasello Winery is here tonight. And his, his grandfather is the one who, who um, got that first license in New Jersey after Prohibition. Uh, I think it was the 68th bonded license in the United States at that time. Uh, and, uh, and so our winery industry really took off uh, in 1981 when the legislature passed the Farm Winery Act that allowed farmers to uh, dedicate three acres of, of land to grapes. And, uh, and at that point, we really um, started to have uh, wineries established where you, you had winery owners, winemakers that were dedicated to really growing the industry. Um, and you had your pioneers and you know, families like uh, which you're going to have here on the call tonight, the, the Heritage family, which is five generations, uh, the Corella family, also multi-generational Tomasellos of four generations of winemakers in the state. And so our long history is now taking us to a point where uh, we can talk about the old. We have Renault Winery, which is the second oldest licensed winery in the United States still open uh, down in, in Egg Harbor. But we also have over 50 wineries open right now in New Jersey, and we're probably going to be well over 60 within the next um, 12 to 16, 18 months. We have a number of wineries awaiting their licenses. So it's an exciting time for our industry. And I think what, what you on the call have to understand is, you know, New Jersey is one of 50 states that make wine. You know, a lot of people in the United States think it's only California, only Oregon and Washington that make wine. 50 states in the United States make wine, and states are making tremendous wines, and we're, we're making wines that are, that are really winning awards across the country. Um, uh, a Cab Franc from Unionville, John Cifelli of Unionville is here tonight, was just featured in Wine Enthusiast uh, in an article talking about Cab Francs on the East Coast. So there's a lot of innovation happening, yes. a lot of high quality, um, and, you know, it's an exciting time to be uh, part of the New Jersey wine scene, and we just encourage everyone who has a chance to get out to one of our 50 wineries that are currently open. Yeah, hey, uh, Ashley, can you put up the um, uh, AVA map? Tom, I have an AVA map of New Jersey, just so people can see the exact areas. Should be under there. And uh, that will show the, now there's uh, now a fourth AVA in New Jersey that was just added last year. There you go. Yeah, we have uh, AVAs are the American Viticultural Areas designated by the federal government, by, by the TTB, which is part of Treasury. And that means that each one of these regions has a unique growing, it's a growing destination for grapes, has a unique um, soil composition, uh, you know, unique geographic uh, composition to, to the land and the contours of the land and so on. But the oldest AVA in the state is up in the Warren Hills area. We have uh, four or five wineries in that region. The Central Delaware Valley, which crosses from Pennsylvania into New Jersey. We do not have a winery directly in the AVA, but we have a few of them that are right on the outskirts, just a couple of miles away. And then the Outer Coastal Plain, which is over 2.2 million acres. It extends from up north in Colts Neck from uh, 4JG's winery all the way down to Cape May. Uh, Cape May now, the Cape May Peninsula, has become the fourth AVA. It's a sub-region of the Outer Coastal Plain. But if you look at the Outer Coastal Plain in, in South Jersey, 
Um, you know, many winemakers here on the call will even say the loamy uh, sand in, in, in the outer coastal plain is very, very comparable to Bordeaux country. You know, and then John could talk about his region, which is up in the central part of the state, uh, the Rhone Valley type wines that can grow there and up north. Warren Hills, just a, a, a different a different area. But we have four ABAs, which is very unique for a state like New Jersey. Um, you know, and, and, and the outer coastal plain is one of the top biggest ABAs in the entire country. Right, and it's 18 years old now, right? Yeah. So it's only been around for a little while. Uh, but <laughs> um, also, I just wanted to tell everybody that if you have any questions uh, for anybody, uh, just go into the Q&A part and ask them, and then we'll get to them eventually. Um, and also, I sent with the... Um, with the package, you all got a uh, the, or the email. You got tasting notes and tasting rules. Obviously, don't wear fragrances, things like that, because well, we also have uh, introduction to wine people here, and we have sommeliers on the line. So it's a wide range. So bear with us. But I wanted to introduce Dr. Gary Pappas here, and he will explain to you the five S's of wine tasting, which some of you may know, some of you may not know. But Gary uh, is our class of 73, right? That's right. That's right. He's yeah. been a Rutgers guy for many, many years. And 80. Yeah. Uh, he's the agricultural agent for the uh, Rutgers Co-op Extension. And he's got a PhD in blueberries. Somebody, Some people even call him the blueberry king. So, <laughs> Gary? All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I came on. Uh, my main function was... Uh, was blueberries in uh, 1984, but as already mentioned, Tom mentioned about how um, you know the the law was changed in New Jersey, and the timing was great because uh, even though I was supposed to do mostly blueberries, um, I got tenure about the time when um, uh, the new law went through, and um, so uh, uh, everybody was coming to me about uh, starting um, grapes and wine. And actually, it was Charlie Tomasello, who uh, I was at his winery, and he said, you know, Gary, nobody at Rutgers is doing anything about grapes and wine. And uh, I figured, well, I got tenure now, so I could do this, all right? So, um, so many of the wineries in New Jersey uh, actually have started in my office. Um, uh, you know, they come in, and we talk about all that's involved in, uh, in starting a wine. Uh, and, and starting a vineyard. So that's a lot of what I do. Um, what I basically tell the blueberry guys is I spend 100% of my time with you guys, and I tell the grape guys I spend 100% of the time with you guys. Uh, the math doesn't work out, but, um, but that's, that's what I tell everybody. Um, but as, as Dan said, um, you know, we, we really need to talk a little bit about um, uh, how to taste wine um, just so you can enjoy it better. I mean, and, and Dan mentioned the five S's. I teach classes all the time to all kinds of levels of people. Um, you'll notice first off that we've got uh, clear glasses here uh, because the first S is sight. Um, so I always say if you have black wine glasses, green wine glasses, red wine glasses, uh, you have two options. The first one and the best one, break them, all right? Mm -hmm. And, and the second one is they now become water glasses, okay? okay. Um, the, the next thing is, is that um, is since it's sight, you want to hold the glass by the stem. Um, I see people, even with a glass like this, holding it, holding it like this. I call this the Louisville slugger grip, okay? Um, because if you hold it like that, what you, what you are first doing is warming it up. Um, no, you're, you're, most of you are at 98.6. So no wine is good at 98.6. So the other is, is you want to look at the color, et cetera. So that's why you hold it by a stem. Um, I do see sometimes people holding it by the, by the base like this. Um, this is either a snob or someone aspiring to be a snob. So no, we don't want to do that. So, um, so the first S is sight. The next is swirl, OK? Um, it's easier to swirl if you've never done it on the table so you don't make a mess, okay? But, um, and why do we do that? Well, we swirl so that we can volatilize the aromas. Uh, you know, your strongest sense is you sense a smell. Um, you all know that because you've smelled some things sometimes and you've got an instant memory of, of your grandmother's house or a field or when you were a kid. So your, your sense of smell is very strong. So, um, 
So as a result, that's when you really can understand a lot about the wine. I mean, you know, is it oat? Is it is it uh, real fruity? Is it uh, uh, have have nice uh, other complexity into it? You can tell a lot about that uh, about wine, but by the aromas. And you can also see if it has flaws. If it has flaws, that's the time to pick it up. Um, uh, I've never had a flaw in a Jersey wine, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, so sniff, right? Sip is the next S, right? So we'll take a taste. And even that, people people tend to like shoot it through the middle of the tongue. No, you need to move it all around in your mouth because we tend to taste sugar in the front, acid on the sides, and bitter in the back. So you really need to taste all three of them. Okay, so that's sip. The last S is savor. Okay, savor. In other words, what am I tasting when I after I've swallowed it? Because wine is the liquid part of the meal. You know, they, they know this in Italy, they know this in France, they know this in Germany. It's the liquid part of the meal. So, you know, the wine I have here is a white Gruner Veltliner, has beautiful acid, etc. So you know, and it has very citrus, lemony. Well, what do you what do you put lemon on, right? Well, on fish. So it's an obvious it's an obvious wine for fish. So those are the five S's: sight, right? Swirl, sniff, sip, and savor. If you do that right away, you are now in the top ten percent of wine knowledge in the country. There you go. Mm -hmm. Dan? We'll come back to Gary later. I know everybody's pretty thirsty, so I wanted to get to our first wine, which is the Bellevue Gruner Veltlina. And uh, I'm going to bring in Scott. Scott, uh, actually, funny enough, I actually met Scott at the Log Cabin event <laughs> the Rutgers alum, uh, at the Rutgers Gardens. Um, he was pouring his Bellevue wine, and we just started talking, and we've uh, seen a lot of each other since then. I met Scott because he was in my wine class at Rutgers. Oh, that's true. That's right. <laughs> sure. As How are you guys just, doing? Okay. Doing great. Now, for people who don't know, Chardonnay is actually the number one wine varietal in New Jersey, but we didn't really want to bring a Chardonnay. Everybody knows Chardonnay. So that's why we wanted to pick the Bruna Vellina, a little uh, more special wine. It's an Austrian grape. It's a little spicier than a Chardonnay and more, a little more similar to a Sauvignon Blanc, but not as fruity. But uh, Scott, take it away. Tell us about Bellevue Winery, one of the sure, sure. wineries out there. Well, I'm really happy that you guys did pick out the Gruner Veltliner for the reasons that you said. I mean, it's an interesting wine that not much is known about. You know, I think there's only uh, three wineries or so in the state that are growing this and producing this, but it is something that's widely right. done throughout Austria um, and is absolutely recognized and respected grape variety that we think has a lot of potential here uh, for our state. So I know everybody's thirsty. So let's get into the wine first, shall we? And then from there, we're going to go into Bellevue. But um, I pour the Gruner. If you haven't already, then go ahead and put it in your glass. Um, this is something that we started growing here on our property in 2013. And uh, it was actually, we, we went that direction uh, for frost prevention. Uh, Gruner Veltliner being grown in Germany is absolutely more acclimated to a cold climate. We were having problems in the winter with freezing. But uh, lo and behold, it makes a great wine here too. So, um, you know, when I put this in my glass, uh, the first thing that I notice here is the straw, almost pale gold sort of color to it. Um, you know, it's, it's almost metallic and shiny here. And uh, swirling it around and sniffing. I get some nectarine, some honeysuckle, sort of peach blossom, butterscotch. Danny, Gary, what do you guys think? Yeah, the butterscotch to me really comes through. Butterscotch, lemon and herb, right. honeysuckle, even a and little now, like beeswax. The, the butterscotch and those sort of flavors usually come from uh, an oak profile, but we did not oak this wine at all. It's 100% mm -hmm. stainless steel. Um, so those sorts of, of flavors are awesome that they come straight out of the grape and the fermentation. Now let's get to the fun part. <laughs> Sip. Wow, that is smooth and crisp. Goes down really easy. And it's not your, your typical Gruner Veltliner either. Some of these can no. be even more acidic. 
than this. Yeah. Um, you know, you do have lime here, sort of like a rind of, of a citrus, you know, maybe maybe orange rind or, or lime mm -hmm. or something like that, but also a zestiness. Um, you know, a, a lot of the time a descriptor for a Gruner Veltliner is celery or celery seed. Yeah. Uh, there celery. is some of that and, and some white pepper, I see too. Yeah. But uh, right. Right. this beer has a fair amount of body to it, mm -hmm. uh, especially for not being oaked. Um, and I attribute that to our late harvest for this variety. That is um, really what we found produces the best flavors for us is getting the maximum maturity out of these fruit as possible. Um, you know, us being the growers as well as the winemakers, uh, we have that control over throughout the process. And uh, it's amazing getting a, a good vintage in where the weather was just right and the grapes ripen up beautifully and then being able to make a, a nice wine out of this. I mean, this is a 2017. So the grapes were harvested in 2017. It was good vintage. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think our 2020 is going to be quite as good as this, but we'll see what becomes of it. Uh, no, I, I don't want to bring it down, but this vintage wasn't the best. 17, we had plenty of sun and uh, we got good maturity on these grapes. Um, but, you know, after our, our fourth S, we're going on to the fifth, which is the savor. So what's going on in your mouth after you've swallowed it? Um, I still have the acidity lasting, some of that zestiness. Um, and it's, it's just pleasant, like, uh, like you guys were talking about. You know, it's great paired with uh, fish because of that acidity. But also, it's, it's really um, well paired with any sort of breaded and fried cutlet. Like, uh, actually, you know, one of the traditional pairings for a Gruner Veltliner is Wiener Schnitzel, which is, you know, just a, a breaded and, and fried uh, veal cut. And, you know, you could do the same with pork or really, you know, your choice. Um, cheeses go great with this as well. You know, a Havarti or a Gouda are my favorites, but you could even go with a softer cheese, like a mozzarella. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the one of the interesting pairings that I actually got from a customer was to pair this with pho. You know, take this, get a nice big bowl of, of pho, and just have at it. It's great together. You know, Scott, I was going to mention that um, I love the mid palate. I mean, it really is nice and full. Um, I've had a lot of Austrian uh, Gruners, and they don't usually have this level of fullness here. Um, th that's a really nice thing, I think. The mid palate is really nice and big. Uh, it really is a nice wine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, had, I had the Gruner uh, uh, about a week or two ago with some uh, grilled salmon, with some letter, lemon and herb butter, and it, mm -hmm. it went delicious. But I could see it also going with that spicy Asian food, or even with fried chicken. Believe it. I believe it, uh, 100%. Lemon chicken. I think lemon chicken, too. <laughs> fantastic. You know? But we're, we're absolutely enamored with this variety. We hope to see more of it in New Jersey. You know, the cool thing about uh, being a, a winemaker and grape grower in New Jersey is we don't have an established uh, wine grape, you know, that New Jersey hangs its hat on. It's not something that, you know, we have to make this one because this is what we make, like you'll find in some parts in France where they, you know, literally only make one thing. Right. We on our wine list have over 30 different wines and in our vineyard we're growing 20 different grapes uh you know some that we've grown for years and years and they just didn't pan out we've pulled them out and put something else in now uh so it's it's a fun stage in this industry where we get to experiment with a lot of different things and uh you know throw a bunch of stuff against the wall and see what sticks uh i'd be one to say that gruner is one of those things that should stick what's the what's the consumer reaction to this to this uh, variety i mean a lot of people don't know about Gruner Veltliner in Austria, but how, what's the consumer reaction that you're wine? Well, I mean, I am seeing people that, uh, you know, would walk up to our wine list and they'd pick a Pinot or they'd pick a Chardonnay. Um, but, you know, being able to get somebody that I know and say, hey, I know you drink this all the time, but try the Gruner. And it's usually one of those things, once you, you know, break that mold that they're in where they, they like Chardonnay and that's all they're gonna have, right. um, then they experience this and say, hey, this is good too maybe even better than what I liked before, or maybe not. But, you know, um, every one of these is, is unique and, and interesting and, you know, worth trying at least one time. But, um, you know, we find that it's, 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 especially for people that aren't in the wine world necessarily, Gruner Veltliner is certainly a mouthful. <laughs> so it's kind of an intimidating thing to order off of the menu. But uh, we find that when we have people try, they they pretty much fall in love with this and, and stop ordering okay. you know or the shard and go for this. Yeah, he's got. Guy, you won best in you won best in class with that wine. 
We did in San actually, Francisco in a in a San Francisco competition out in California. There is about thirty other Gruner Veltliners entered into the San Francisco wine, uh, Chronicle Wine Competition, which is the biggest in the U.S. And uh, yeah, we we took best in class, so the best Gruner Veltliner in the competition. We beat out California, Washington, New York, all these other states, and that was huge for us to to. To show right. that New Jersey can make wines just as well as any other winemaking region in the U.S., um, let alone the world. Okay. Yeah, Scott, a question came in from Prudence in uh, California. She asked, when is the harvest time in New Jersey? I'm from California. And right. I, well, I, yeah, you guys can answer basically so, this week since it's going to so rain yeah, next week. <laughs> yeah, for, for this grape, uh, we actually harvested, uh, it was about the 20th of September, I want to say. Uh, or the week right after I flip back in my calendar, but usually it's, it's late September. Um, mm -hmm. And actually in Austria, that's more of a uh, mid-October. So we are very early here. We have a much warmer climate, so things ripen up faster. For Gruner Veltliner, generally at Bellevue, we're picking in late September. Um, but you know, our harvest, since we grow so many different varieties and they all ripen at different times, uh, will actually start in late August and go through sometimes into November. Usually we're finished by late October. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, in fact, I just saw something last week too about Bellevue. Uh, Atlantic City Weekly named uh, Bellevue Winery as one of the five best fire pits in South Jersey. Did you see that, Scott? <laughs> I did. I did. And I was yeah. happy with that. That's something we've been trying to do last fall. You know, something cool to do, get out of the house, come sit by the fire pit and sip some wine. Right. You have uh, music and uh, and food trucks and everything there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's a nice time. And you, and you guys, your Landisville is right next to Vineland. So yeah. Vineland is yeah. home of vines. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that we always tout. You know, this this area before Prohibition was one of the most densely planted for grape vines. Um, okay. You know, Vineland was Welch's headquarters, and that yep. is not 10 minutes from us. Um, but yeah, you know, being in, in the middle of South Jersey was quite a drive to campus, quite a, a difference from, you know, my start down here to ending up in New Brunswick. Um, but, you know, I, I love both sides of it. Okay. And you guys, your family has been farming since 1914. Yep, that's correct. Right. I'm, the, I'm the fifth generation of our family. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, my great great grandfather came over from Italy, started our farm here. Uh, we were a vegetable farm for a long time. And uh, in the year 2000, my mother and father started the winery. And uh, by 2002, we stopped doing any vegetable farming and were full bore into grape growing and uh, winemaking. And now we're up to uh, 50 acres of vineyards. And that is all of our production. So all the wines that we make are grown here on our property. Okay, well, good. Now, now tell me, did, did you bring Bellevue into the dorms at Rutgers? And, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. would, would, would people yeah. drink wine or did all oh, they wanted his beer at the time? Uh, well, well, the girls were absolutely thrilled. My guy friends, you know, not, not necessarily. They're kind of in the same boat, you know, as you were, Danny. But um, when it's free, you know, it, it's kind of an easy sell. You know, so I, I think I made some wine enthusiasts in my time in the dorms. I want to say, or it's one time in particular that stands out was when my brother's wedding. Um, you know, they just opened up a whole bunch of wine for my brother's wedding. So at the end of the next day, they basically just handed me two cases of wine that were already open, but pretty much the bottles were all full, and just said, "Here you go, Scott. Go have fun at college." And uh, we did. He... It's a way to make friends fast. Yes. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Very good. And yeah, Bellevue has consistently won uh, awards at the uh, Guard State Wine Challenge at the New Jersey State Fair and the Governor's Cup competitions. And I actually just had uh, your pet, Nat, and that was excellent, too. Really enjoyed it. Thank so but that's good. Now, for some of you who weren't allowed to get the Bellevue Winery because of New Jersey's archaic shipping regulations, we also had those others got Aramella from uh, Tomasello Winery. And Charlie, can you tell us a couple things about that? Sure, Aramella is a, um, a hybrid, comes out of uh, Cornell. It's a cross between Traminet and Revat 34. Traminet's one of its parents is uh, Gewurztraminer. So it's a kind of a spicy uh, white. We've been growing it for a few years. One of the greatest viticultural excitements about Aramella is it's cold, stable, uh, winter hardy to about minus 17 degrees. So uh, if you plant, uh, if you if you plan Aramelia, chances are it won't freeze on you. Um, but it makes a really nice spicy dry white wine, uh, as you can see, um, a beautiful color. Um, uh, it it is 
um, Moscato-esque in its character, has kind of hints of pineapple, honeysuckle, floral hints, um, and uh, it has a nice, um, this one, we, we have no, this, this is bone dry, I have no residual sugar, it's um, uh, a nice crisp, uh, acidic, uh, kind of drier white. I personally think it goes great with uh, Chinese food. I, I have it with uh, General Chow's chicken all the time. So I think it's a really good choice. But I, I, I've had it with uh, pesto chicken and asparagus, and it went very well with that. There very, very few wines pair well with go. asparagus, too. Yeah, yeah, and I've had it with Thai food, Charlie. I think there you go. Really yeah, I think nice. any, any Asian fusion food, um, it works with spicy character. It works nicely with it balances. So. Yeah, We're very happy it. with it. We've been growing for a couple of years and uh, have sold out every year and uh, it, it's going real well. So pretty hardy. Hardy, oh, good. Yeah, I actually uh, get a little lychee nut in here and uh, lime leaf and even honeydew melon. There you but go. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. All right. How much of this have you got, Charlie? Um, twice. I'd say we have about four acres at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Generally, make um, a couple hundred cases, so it's it's well received. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. John, you're up next. I'm going to say for the uh, cap. Sure. Okay, that's one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Oh. Sorry, due to social distancing, we have to be very careful who sits where. Uh, <laughs> Gary, I don't want to breathe on your plate. Okay. <laughs> this is John Spelling. He was uh, Seb's class of 09. No, no, I'm Cook. You Cook? All right. Cook. Well, and remember, uh, <laughs> Cook became Seb's in 2007. So you were you started before it became Seb's. So you are right. Cook. That's true. I actually think I have the last Cook diploma. No, because um, Danny said that Good Ruckers and Cook graduates take an extra year. I'm a much better co graduate than Danny because I took three extra years. <laughs> and um, you want me to talk about this or the weather well, work? Let's talk about this first. Uh, Unionville Winery is in the Delaware, Central of Delaware AVA. Uh, started in 87 and basically focused on what Burgundy and Rhone varietals. Um, but John, since he graduated with meteorology from Rutgers, we call him the Al Roker of the New Jersey wine industry. <laughs> so he's going to give us sort of a, um, a uh, view on the harvest this year and how everything's been going. So yeah, tell us that. Sure. So uh, with my degree in meteorology, I kind of take on a de facto weather and climate role uh, for some people in the industry. And um, for the past this will be the third year that I've written sort of a, a vintage summary and a, a, a climate history of uh, the growing season. And my background is not in grape growing or viticulture, so it's been climbing a learning curve and sort of applying uh, what I know about meteorology and climate and applying it to what I've learned uh, with grape growing over the past uh, five years now as a general manager at Unionville, which has been a lot of fun because uh, I've come to really love grape growing and I've always loved weather. Um, and so this year was, this year was uh, trials and tribulations, not just for COVID reasons, but, uh, but really the, uh, the season through the gamut at New Jersey Grape Growers started the year with uh, frost, widespread frost. And we had a very cool April and very cool May, which um, came on the heels of, of a very warm winter. And I went and pulled up uh, some stats from the Office of the State Climatologist, who's Dave Robinson, works through Rutgers, fantastic resource for the industry. And um, his, his office published a chart of where all the, the months of the past 12 uh, have fallen uh, relatively compared to normal. Um, and this clocked in as the seventh warmest winter in 130 years of recorded climate history. So January through March, this was the sixth warmest March, the fourth warmest February. So everyone was thinking early bud break and some early budding varieties did push out new growth. Uh, and then it kind of got stuck because April was cool and May was cool. And I know at Unionville, we have, uh, we have a pest that, that eats buds when they get buzzy, when they get soft, a, a great flea leaf beetle. And so we had Chardonnay 
that was like ready to go and was ready to butt out and stayed in that little fuzzy phase without leaves pushing out like two extra weeks than it normally does. Oh. And so that was like a feast for those little bugs. And then uh, mm -hmm. when they did finally butt out and leaf out, uh, then we had frost right on the heels of that. So we, we waited two extra weeks for our Chardonnay to push out um, just to have a lot of the primary buds, those first growths that come out um, on the plant to get um, hit by frost and then knocked off. So that happened throughout May. It happened widespread. I, I talked to a lot of growers statewide that, uh, that had bad frost hits. Happened all the way down to Cape May. Um, I, I know uh, Todd Worker at Hawk Haven had uh, frost damage all the way down to the southern tip of the state. And then as we got through that, we had stretches of, of rain that were somewhat localized. We had a tropical storm in July that brought heavy rains. We had another one in early August that uh, brought heavy rains. And so there's a lot of opportunities for disease pressure to creep into the vineyard. Uh, and that really continued right into uh, September. Mm -hmm. And then everybody started crying about birds. And mm -hmm. you could have seen it coming because if you're reading agricultural community Facebook pages, you see blueberry farmers in Virginia talking about how it's the worst bird year ever. And then you hear cranberry growers in Maryland saying it's the worst bird year ever. And you just sort of saw them migrating up the coast. And, uh, and sure enough, I, I, I know uh, talking to Scott from Bellevue, he said he spent plenty of time uh, out in the vineyard with the shotgun, just sort of blasting away, trying to scare them off. Um, obviously with the depredation permit as it needs to be. And uh, so we had, a, we had a year where statewide, everyone was dealing with um, losing some crop early in the year frost, struggling to get it through the season and then uh, fending off birds at the end of the year. And then even when things should have improved in late September and early October, we had long stretches of what should have been wire to wire, dawn to dusk sunlight. We had to deal with 10 to 15 percent um, solar radiation loss to haze from the California wildfires. So people are thinking that smoke taint is the extent of the impact on a grape growing region, but actually all the way on the East Coast, we had days and days of haze where it should have been perfect ripening weather. So 20 was definitely a challenging year, but you can make great wine in challenging years. Uh, good winemakers make good wines and great wines, um, even in challenging growing years. And, uh, and I like to think that years like 18 and 20 now are uh, helping us all get better. And um, so I, I, I just think that it's sort of, um, can't say trial by fire, that would be yeah. California shtick, but um, trial by just about everything else in uh, 2020. Yeah, it's not like California or Washington or even Oregon that every year, almost every year, they have one bad year every decade. Right. Whereas here, it's challenging every other year sometimes. So, but uh, that's good. And uh, but uh, the temperature and climate in New Jersey, especially the outer coastal plain, is very similar to Bordeaux, and has been proven that even the soils too have been. And people are have compared it to Bordeaux many times. Uh, so, John's also the executive director of the Winemakers Co-op. Uh, if you can tell us something quick about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Winemakers Co-op is a group of wineries that are encouraging uh, the production and the acceptance and working for the promotion of uh, fine wines of the state, dry wines of the state. Uh, everyone in the co-op has to have a certain percentage of their portfolio be vinifera wines, the wines that you're going to find in fine wine shops and on fine wine lists, and uh, hoping, hoping to develop the market for that. Uh, which then you have a market for $50 Chardonnay and $60 Pinot Noir and $70 Cabernet Franc. That helps people invest in grape growing for those varieties and farmers need that kind of support. So the, if we can elevate the, uh, the price for wine grapes in the state, uh, then more people come in and plant more grapes and, and then ultimately we have a, a more thriving industry. Right, and uh, I think almost everybody in that group is uh, one way or another alumni of Rutgers or connected to Rutgers. Yeah, I think that's right. In some way. Yeah, I think everyone's so, got a connection. Which is good. And it's a good group. These guys also do, they throw a lot of events. Uh, or twice a year you do throw events? Well, this year, obviously, every all events are canceled, but you, typically they usually do. Yeah, we do uh, two events a year, and uh, Heritage is on the phone here, and Bill's going to mm -hmm. talk a little bit, but uh, his son, Rich, uh, is a Rutgers grad, and I think they're hosting one of the events next year. Yes. Now, if you can go, uh, everybody got their cab front. From Unionville. Hmm. Beautiful berries, red berries. No, this is not the typical cat from. Oh, by the way, for those people who are used to a little bit about how to make thicker cat This is an unoaked 
have prongs. So there is no wood in here at all, both stainless steel. Sure. Julie. So we, uh, we, we named the wine Silver Lining. Uh, we had such a bad year in 18. 2018 was a wet year for everybody in New Jersey, but I was, I was doing a little uh, back of the napkin homework from the, uh, the climate site, and it was particularly bad for the north. Uh, we had, uh, uh, in July and August, for perspective, um, in this year, uh, the northern zone on the climate site, the state climate site, had 11.9 inches over those two months, and that was a wet year compared to average. 11.9 inches. You compare that to 2018 when we had 19.1 inches. So, so seven inches more over the two months in uh, 2018 compared to this year. And we didn't make any classified red wine. All of our red wines got declassified uh, or, or we sold it to distilleries. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how unenthusiastic we were about our um, 18 reds. And at that point, we were doing pretty well in the sales cycle. And so I told our winemaker that we needed to make uh, a quick to market red wine. And, and so uh, actually, it was a Finger Lakes red. Uh, a Cap Franc from the Finger Lakes by a producer named Damiani that I said basically to my winemaker, make this. <laughs> right. And uh, and this is what he came up with. So we, we put uh, five tons of Cabernet Franc uh, to this style. It's uh, slightly carbonic maceration. Um, so it pulls out a lot of those very fruity notes. Um, like Danny said, it, it's 100% steel fermented and, and it's only, it was only aged for a couple months in tank before it went into bottle. Uh, and so we say that this was the, the silver lining was that 2019 was a fantastic vintage for most of the state. And um, so we say that the, the creation uh, of this wine out of necessity from the, the cloudy, rainy year of 2018, this was our silver lining at Unionville. Um, and then we released it uh, serendipitously uh, right in the midst of COVID. Yeah. And we encourage people to find uh, you know, their own silver linings during uh, a really terrible time for, for everybody in the wine industry and, and, and beyond. And uh, it's been our best seller. Yeah. Since we released it. To me, this is a great wine for Thanksgiving. It would go great with a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I just had a piece of uh, herbed goat cheese, and it pairs wonderful with it. And for those of you that don't know, it's a, a carbonic maceration, a partial mm -hmm. carbonic maceration. So that means that the, a lot of the fermentation occurs in the grape. Yes. And so you always are able to pick up a little bit of banana in there. Mm -hmm. And and that is like Beaujolais. So uh, uh, it really is. So it is really nice, really light, nice, light, fruity, this kind of thing. Fruity, so, this kind of thing. So, yep. and uh, as Dan said, it'd be great with Thanksgiving, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is your cranberry sauce. Yes. Yes. Right. I was going with cranberry. Anything herbal. Uh, now, uh, John also makes one of my favorite wines, the uh, Pheasant Hill Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a wine I think uh, James Suckling or Robert Parker gave it 90 points. Uh, I, I, I wish it was Parker, but it was Suckling. Oh, it was Suckling. <laughs> okay. But it was delicious. It was a, barrel fermented white um, and uh, in fact um, many of you may know uh, the restaurant in downtown New Brunswick stage, stage left for Catherine Lombardi and the sommelier and owner of that place he goes that's the only New Jersey wine I'll stock in my uh, restaurant and he, he loves it but uh, the that's, other that's because I used to bus boy oh, okay, he's a bus <laughs> okay that's why the other uh, popular ones that uh, from Union Woodville uh, they have a uh, wine called the Big O, which is a Bordeaux-style blend, and a uh, port-style Chamberson that was started by Cameron Stark, one of uh, New Jersey's well-qualified winemakers, uh, came out with it, and their port is delicious. I also just tried, they just came out also with a pet nat, uh, sparkling, um, out of, that's Riesling, right? Mm -hmm. You have it out of, it was delicious. It was uh, like a sour apple sweet tart, so if you like that taste, and it was a wonderful pet nat. So, all right, so that's that, and we're going to have, uh, oh, I was going to say, any new varietals uh, that you're experimenting with right now? Because a lot of uh, New Jersey wineries are diversifying into Spanish, French, or Italian wines, uh, and even German wines and Austrian wines. So what are you guys doing? Yeah, you know, when you prep me for that question, I, I have my answer, but I also, not to put Gary on the spot, but I think if, um, can you talk about your Italian varieties after I, I finish sure. your, the, that project? So uh, as far as you asked me about my familiarity with other varieties around the state, I, I think that, um, I think Scott's absolutely right about the Gruner. I think it's a benchmark white wine for the state. Mm -hmm. And um, to my knowledge, uh, Scott, do you know anybody besides Mount Salem that's doing Gruner? The only other one that um, I know of is Monroeville. So it's those two and oh. us. Okay. So, I mean, there's, you'll find grapes that there's one or two or maybe three wineries that, that, are, that are doing them. Uh, Blau Frankish is another up-and-coming grape. It, it, 
actually is another one that Scott does. I, I think Charlie does Tomasello do a Bluff Frankish. We do. And um, and uh, and then the two that are up in Pittstown, Mount Salem and uh, Benaduce, both do it. So I think there's there's four. If I'm missing one, it's five wineries that are doing Blau Frankish, which I think is a, has great potential for the whole state. Uh, you mentioned the Rhone program at Unionville. We have four grapes all to ourselves. Uh, we we have Marsan and Roussan and Picou Blanc, which are all white Rhone varieties. So uh, for folks at home, that's southeast France, the Rhone Valley. It's home to Syrah, it's the ancestral home of Syrah and Viognier. Uh, so we have three white Rhone varieties that, to my knowledge, we're the only ones growing and making wine from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we have one red called Cunoise, which is uh, an esoteric red grape that's used uh, mostly in the Chateauneuf de Pop blend in the Southern Rhone. And then there are a handful of producers around the country, maybe like less than 10, uh, that make varietal Cunoise. And it's really late ripener. We don't always get it ripe ourselves and goes into rosé. Uh, but we make a, a red wine from Cunoise maybe every third year for if, if we're lucky if we get the right kind of season I, I like it i tried it at the eastern winery expo and it, it was very good for for a new jersey grown quinoa and then besides varieties i think that um, another thing that's interesting to talk about as far as new trends is uh the styles of wines that are being made in new jersey and you mentioned uh pet nat yes uh and i, I know that heritage made a, a piquette and uh, a lot of wineries are playing with carbonic and playing with nouveau style uh, there are orange wines being made in New Jersey. That's skin contact white wines, uh, 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 also using the traditional like fleur uh, on top of the uh, oxidized whites in the barrel, things like that. So I think that uh, besides just varieties, I think there's a whole lot of different styles being made, um, which is not surprising because we're a young industry and we're still experimenting with all sorts of things. Absolutely. Well, thank you, John. Sure. Appreciate it. Now we're going to go on to the Tomasello Palmares for the people who had the uh, Thomas Allo package. So this is a um, 2017 Pinot Noir um, Outer Coastal Plain that we grew. So Pinot Noir kind of falls into the category of, um, uh, my brother calls it uh, uh, the grape of dreams and sometimes your dreams can become a nightmare. Um, you can have an absolutely beautiful crop of Pinot Noir and get a nasty August rainstorm and end up with a mess on your hands. But uh, so back to what John said, uh, it's kind of weather dependent and every other year or so we make a, a nice Pinot Noir. This is a 17. It was a good year. It was picked on September 1st, 21.8 uh, was the harvest bricks. It's been about eight months in second year uh, American oak. And um, it's often been, Pinot Noir has often been called a white wine masquerading as a red. So um, I think this is a pretty good indication of, uh, of what we have here. Um, kind of a lighter color, um, uh, nice fruit character. Nice kind of mid-mouth structure here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Softer head. I like it too, Charlie, because, nice. you know, it's not just uh, one dimensional and that it's just fruit. Um, you know, I, I get some herbaceous characters to it, you know, some spice to it. Um, I mean, that's what I like about uh, cooler temperature, cooler climate Pinot Noirs is that they, they have uh, not just this one dimensional uh, taste, you know, and, and aromas. And, and this, this carries through, this has, you know, multi layers here, and that's really pretty. Yeah. Like think, on the taste, you know, it says uh, black cherry and stewed fruit. Exactly. That's where it is right there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think Pinot Noir is kind of a multi-dimensional wine. And I think um, when you come full circle drinking red wine, you come back to Pinot Noir. It's got all, all of the subtle character. It's very, it's a, it's, it, it isn't a wine that bowls you over, but it just has soft, subtle complexity. Right. And to me, it is the two great things to have with this. One, salmon on the grill. Okay. And, and the two is, uh, which they do in France, is roast duck. So th those two things uh, are slam dunks, you know, um, with Pinot Noir. I would concur. Mm -hmm. Really pretty. Yeah. And you know, the other nice thing is it's it's a low, it's not high alcohol, Charlie. You know. Oh. Right. You know? I think right. generally uh, right around twelve. Yeah. Right. That one's a little higher, I think. 
Yeah, this is 12.6. I mean, I, you know, that's great. That's really great. I, you know, I have a hard time when you have a Pinot Noir that's 16.2, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, a question came in for uh, any of you guys. Uh, the uh, New Jersey, uh, from Minch, uh, the New Jersey uh, vines, are they, vineyards, are they at risk and concerned about the spotted, spotted lanternfly oh infestation God. that's in Hunterdon County currently? And trees are being impacted. Are you guys, I mean, I know it hasn't come down to South Jersey yet. Oh, yeah. We, oh, it has oh, yeah. Uh, we've got it in Atlantic I've County. Around here. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, yeah. The whole state is worried about that, let me tell you. And, and I'll let these guys comment on it. But, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. I don't think we found it in Cape May yet. But um, the rest of the state uh, has been, it's been found. Yeah, I've killed three or four already, but uh, it's ha uh, hatching uh, egg season right now. So they're laying their eggs. So it may come back bad and nice here. Anybody? My I've brother Jack has been out. I think we've sprayed twice for it. Uh, we've seen it in our vineyard, but uh, <laughs> we've been able to keep it under control at this point. They don't, they don't but yeah, uh, we, it's definitely out there. Very, it's very out there and the, the Department of Ag has been really doing uh, a good job trying to maintain it and, and, and keep a close watch on it because neighboring state Pennsylvania got hit bad by it last year. The vineyard. Right. And, the, and it yeah. has killed vineyards. I mean, it, yeah. it actually, this thing doesn't just, it, it doesn't go after grapes. It, it actually kills your vine and, uh, and it's killed, uh, you know, I was at a meeting uh, a couple of years ago actually. And, and, uh, and there were vines in uh, Bucks County, um, uh, Pennsylvania and the, and the vines were dead. From this thing, so I mean, it's this is something we really have to stay on top of. And as Tom said, um, the Department of Agriculture has been doing a really good job. I mean, they are on top of this thing. And of course, then Rutgers has also been doing a lot of research um, as far as control and yes. scouting and all of that too. So Rutgers and the Department of Ag have been working together with this. Dan, can I happen? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Um, Besides, yeah, Tom's right about the USDA, the Department of Ag, but also uh, Rutgers. I got to tip my hat big time to both because they were at Unionville between the two of them four times in the past 12 months, scouting for trees, marking trees, knocking them down, and then scouting my property in the middle of the winter, teams of four or five going out into the woods onto the tree lines and finding egg masses and scraping them off and, and putting them in alcohol. And that's just been, I, I believe, so important because I've heard growers uh, neighbors that have the the tree of heaven, the Atlantis tree, that have infestations, and they're further south and east than me. And I think that it was because of the work that Rutgers and the Department of Ag did that made the difference in why I've only seen one or two or three per plant per, at peak. And I put on my waders and walked to my creek bed um, on the tree line about a week ago and I spotted about 15 egg masses wow. and, I'm, and I, I guarantee that my team will be out there this winter because I don't think Rutgers is going to do it for me anymore because yeah. I think the, the, the uh, war front against lanternfly has moved south and east. I think they're thinking about protecting Monmouth County and, and Atlantic and whatnot. Okay. Um, so I think I'm on my own now, but we'll definitely be repeating that process. And I would just encourage any viewer to, uh, if you have Atlantis, if you have walnuts, if you have maple, if you have orchards nearby, um, learn what those egg masses look like. And if, if you just find a half dozen of them on your trees and you scrape them and you drop them into a cup of alcohol, you're stopping thousands of these things from being born and spreading around your area uh, next year. Yeah, they originally came from China, I believe, and then they came through uh, Washington State or into uh, Pennsylvania. Right now, uh, they were located. But uh, a uh, question for Tom, the pride of Sayreville. Um, the Garden State Wine Growers Association, uh, they used to do a lot of festivals. Now, again, everything was canceled this year. Are you guys going to come back with some things uh, next year? Well, actually, the festivals are going on. Um, oh, yeah. we, we elected as an association a couple of years ago um, not to produce our own festivals, but support those of festival promoters that we have a lot of wineries that still want to go to festivals, so we market them. But actually, during COVID, we created a plan based on the 500 gathering uh, limitation in the executive order by Governor Murphy. We created a plan for the ABC that a festival can happen during COVID-19. And two weeks ago, the first festival occurred, the Sip Into Autumn event down in uh, Gloucester County Park uh, on the mm -hmm. fairgrounds. There is the, uh, the Grand Harvest, which will be at, in Morristown this weekend. And then there's one later in the month in Pennsville. And then Great Adventure is going to do theirs. 
we're supporting each one with some marketing efforts, but the festivals are occurring and the way they are is it's limited to 500 people per day. Um, everyone has to be masked. There's a queue line so that when they're going up to taste at a winery, they have to wait to be called up. And then there's only eight people allowed at a tasting at one time. Um, and I went to the one in, in Gloucester County Park just to see how how it would be executed, and it went off fine. And and uh, they've been sold out, and uh, and they're happening. But you know, the state listened to our advice on how to execute it that it can happen, and and they're moving forward. That's really great to hear because uh, although I like these virtual tastings, they're not. I'd rather be live with people and. Uh, doing it that way, and hopefully, knock on wood, one day we'll uh, get back to doing that. Hopefully, Absolutely. sooner rather than later. Yeah. Uh, also, and a, a few other states are really investing in their wine future, specifically like Texas, Michigan, Arizona, Virginia, and New Mexico. Uh, what is New Jersey and doing anything to invest in I the future? I think the one the the one big thing, and I think the people that have been on this call that have been around a while, a lot longer than me, can say, is we finally have. Like, we have a governor who's been very, very supportive of the industry. In fact, you know, two years ago at the our New Jersey wine competition event at the governor's mansion, which he hosted, the first lady announced only New Jersey wine would be served there, and they followed through on that. Um, but the governor has gotten behind our industry. The director of tourism now has gotten behind it. We actually have wine featured in commercials for tourism. It's not all about the Jersey Shore. You know, wineries are in those commercials, and and the Department of Ag always has supported us. Uh, you know, we wish we could get more money and more funding. You know, to do a lot more marketing, but I, I think one of the toughest sells over the years was to get the buy-in from the administration to support us, and I think at least we have that now, which is encouraging. Um, you know, and 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 for example. Uh, we're going to do a media tour at the end of October with a group of wine writers coming in, you know, in the middle of COVID, but we're going to do a safe tour with writers based on the East Coast. And the director of tourism put a person in his office to work with me on, it. you know, dedicated time for them. Uh, you know, the tourism bureaus in South Jersey are, are dedicating time to it. So I think it's encouraging. Um, you know, other states around the country have benefited um, with their growth, like Texas is now 500 wineries strong. You know, people don't realize when I get to the point of, you know, people always think California, Oregon, Washington, but you know, Texas is one of the top five wine producing states in the country, over 500 wineries. You know, other states really, Ohio has, you know, over 300. Pennsylvania next door has over 300. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot happening. And I think as our industry continues to grow, and as you know, we continue, these gentlemen continue to produce award-winning wines and, and really raise the bar for our product. It's only going to increase, you know, the sales of wine, which increase the excise tax, which we get our funding from for a grant. Back to you for a bunch of stuff. Okay, that will that makes sense. Hopefully it's it's nice to have New Jersey backing the wineries because for years it has been such a unfriendly wine state. But uh, to see a turnaround coming that really will help you the industry. You know, Tom, I think the other thing that you mentioned, you know, we have a lot of alumni from all over the country here, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and you mentioned, you know, a lot of people in this country kind of think wine only comes from California, Washington, and Oregon. And, uh, and we're showing that these wines are beautiful, but the thing is, these people are from all over the country. They really need to go out and taste Ohio wine and Indiana wine and Texas wine because um, they really make all over the country now really, really great wines. So, uh, you know, that's one nice thing about uh, a tasting like this. Yeah, we're doing New Jersey wines and we believe they're world class wines. But, you know, if you're, if you're living in Indiana, you need to go taste those Indiana wines. And if you're in Ohio, that's you the need beauty, to taste Gary. I was going to say, Gary, that's the beauty of when you go to the East, the Eastern Wine Ec Winery Expo right. and you have wines from the different regions and you get to try them. Last year, I was in Washington, D.C. at a wine conference that Wine America put on, and they always have a night where they invite the congressional staff and it's tasting wines from, from every wine region in the country. And, right. you know, you're, you're tasting, you know, whites from Arizona and you're tasting you know, wine from Vermont and, and from other states, and, and it opens your eye to the quality of product that's being made. 
That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're going to go to Thomas Sella Winery now. Um, and a great man once said that Cabernet Sauvignon thrives where <coughs> apples and peaches do because of the long growing season and well drained soils. That great man just happened to be Dr. Gary Pavlis right here. <laughs> so he said that. So introducing Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, by the way, there is a fly in the room. So I brought a scarlet swatter just in case it lands on Gary's head. Not to get political at all, but uh, just, just in case. So, because yeah, I don't no fly around. sit on me for 15 minutes. No, I get that right. no, no. So, Charlie, uh, I, you guys, I mean, you're one of the oldest wineries in New Jersey. Uh, I guess I think you guys we are there. The the oldest winery at this point because Rinaldo is pretty much no, it. bankrupt, right? Yes. yes. So uh, you were waiting, you were, not you, your grandfather was waiting in line uh, as prohibition was ending, and right. so you could, guys could start the winery. Uh, that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, Renault actually was the second oldest commercial winery in the United States, but it's not open at the moment. So that's open. It's open? They've opened under the new ownership. It's actually okay. going, going well right now. So, yeah, nobody would know the second oldest winery in the United States is in New Jersey, right, right outside of Atlantic City. So, but uh, actually, Ashley, can you put the uh, picture of Peter Mondavi up for me? And I hope you guys decanted it, if possible. This is the uh, Palmaris Outer Coastal Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon. That, if, uh, for anybody who doesn't know wine, that is the infamous Peter Mondavi Jr. Uh, I was having dinner with him, and him and uh, Chuck Wagner from Camus and a couple other wine dignitaries, and I brought a bottle of the 2012 Palmaris Cabernet Sauvignon. I didn't tell them what it was. I gave it to them. They were all very, very impressed. That's true. They really enjoyed it, and when I told them that it was from New Jersey, they went, what? It can't be from New Jersey. They didn't believe me, but I showed it to them and I explained to them. Uh, 2012 was a very good year, and it was a, a stunning wine. And even the greatest winemakers in California really enjoyed it. So I was uh, happy to do that. It was a fun dinner. Thanks, so, Charlie. Charlie, tell us about the uh, Palmaris. Well, uh, uh, back in 2009 or 2008 or so, we used to make Cabernet Sauvignon and. Um, we, we were growing Petit Verdot and Franc as well, and I one I became very involved with John Mahoney, good friend of Gary and I, and um, used to go to John's porch and drink uh, wine on a Tuesday night, all wines from all over the world. And uh, one Sunday, I a group of us tasted all fourteen second growth Bordeaux's, and um, what That's that right. little uh, adventure taught me was that. Uh, <laughs> Great Cabernet Sauvignon is not just Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot and some Cap Franc. So since uh, since 2009, uh, we've been making this pretty much consistent blend of 75% Cab Sauvignon, 20% Petit Verdot and 5% Cap Franc. This is the 2015, the last of it. I, I think the Rutgers people bought almost all of the uh, remaining uh, uh, 15. Uh, we have uh, about a thousand cases besides that are that are leaving for China in a couple weeks, but um, of, of what's available domestically, that was it. And we're moving to the 16 shortly. But we really like this wine. This was um, uh, this was harvested uh, and made separately. Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, Cab Sauvignon, uh, 31 uh, months in um, Nevere and American oak. Uh, used primarily new oak for um, the Cab Sauvignon and some of the Petit Verdot and second year oak, American oak for Cab Franc. Um, and it's a pretty, uh, pretty dense wine. It, it is, uh, you'll get in the nose, kind of the, the way I kind of structure it in my head is the Franc is the dried rose petal in the front. The Petit Verdot contributes to the middle mouth structure and the Cab Sauvignon kind of finishes the back of the wine. But you'll get kind of a little dried rose petal in there, some chocolate, tobacco, uh, Latakia, if you will. Some of the oak comes through. Um, 
at this point, it's a 15 and you need the, the can. And of course, the 10 was an incredible wine. The 12 went very well. The 15 is, has been very good to us. Uh, we're about to release the 16 that we're happy with. Um, we think the 19 should be really good. So it's not impossible to make really, um, really nice, I think, red wine in New Jersey. It's just a matter of being patient. And I think you can fix a lot of um, some of the weather related stuff that you have to deal with if you're persistent and, and uh, can let it hang long enough and, and be patient out there. And sometimes a little high tech uh, reverse osmosis doesn't hurt, but uh, not too often <laughs> occasionally. But um, that's what we do. And we try to get, try to use the oak as a means to soften and round the wine and consolidate uh, what might be a little bit thin at the beginning, but after a long enough period, uh, kind of consolidates and finishes. Charlie, it's beautiful. I mean, this easily would rank with, with the second growth. <laughs> no oh, no that's problem. <laughs> I, I mean, wish really... I could get, I wish I could get second growth money for it, Gary. I, Yes, oh, right. yeah, no, no. <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> complex <laughs> nose. It's incredible. Beautiful, complex nose. I just had a bottle of the 2010, by the way. Yeah. And and th that is still got much more life in it. It's amazing. I mean, it really is. It's it's like this one, but I think a little more leather has come up. Um, a little uh, more pipe tobacco has come up. But um, this is gorgeous. Really, is gorgeous. Yeah, one. I like it because you get the fruitiness and spiciness up front. And then on the on the front palate, and then on the mid palate, you get more of an earthy, mushroomy right. kind of taste to it. Yeah. And, and we, strawberry. We, th cranberry. we think filet mignon is about right with this, and we've also had it with rack of lamb, with right, brown lamb sauce stuff. and small uh, small new potatoes and and uh, <laughs> wilted spinach and all that. So it it works very nicely with a big meal. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Even some chalkiness and uh, like a dusty cocoa finish. Right. I can also have, you know, people don't, people, you should also have it with chocolate at the end of your, I mean, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon yeah. works uh, great with uh, dense chocolate, so. One of one of the few dry wines that will pair well with chocolate. So, so but we'll have chocolate with the blueberry. Okay, there you go. So I'm very happy with it. It's been mm -hmm. very well. Uh, yeah, also uh, Tomasella Winery has won a lot of awards also, uh, or Garden State Wine Challenge. Uh, both the Palmaris uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Reds won Best Red in 2017 and 2019. I think 2017, uh, Charlie, you won the uh, Best of Show for the Vidal Blanc Dessert Wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one has won the Governor's Cup at least five times. Yeah, that's a nice wine. Yeah, that's <laughs> stellar. And then uh, one of my personal favorites is your uh, single varietal Petit Verdot. Which uh, not too many people do, but I really enjoy it. Mm. Now that that actually has a uh, a little bit of it's kind of the inverted blend. It has a little bit of cab and a little bit of franc, but in different proportions. Mm. So, yeah. Sure. So I, you know, I think I think certainly um, certainly sandy loam soil, outer coastal plain, uh, 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 one degree day less than Rutherford, a little maritime influence. I think it's all the components are there. If if we uh, could get back to some reasonably normal weather. Uh, and um, <laughs> this year has been quite the challenge and uh, we may get that RO machine out yet, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> gonna be, it, it could be could be a bit challenging. I'm not sure we'll release a Palmaris in 2020. We'll have to see how it comes out, so. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't do a Palmaris every year? Uh, most every year we do release uh, a Palmaris, um, it, but in, in a couple of years we've just skipped the vintage completely right. um, mm -hmm. when it's just not there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No reason to put it out. Yeah. Um, and Charlie, do you think, uh, as far as New Jersey, do you think New Jersey wine can compete on a national or international scale? Um, that's a hard question. Uh, I, I think that global. I think that on any given day, if we're not looking at labels and if we uh, make our very best effort, we can make wine with just about anybody. Uh, I think I think great wine is made everywhere. I don't think it's specific to New Jersey or California or Oregon. I, I mean, you can have great wine in any state. Um, so yeah, I think we can compete. I think we have we have some negative. Uh, preconditions about how I was at uh, we had this wine at the Capitol Grill one year and uh, in Cherry Hill and we poured it and I went to a cellar I went to a, 
a tasting there and um, guy picks up the bottle and he looks at it and says, tell me about this outer coastal plain. And I described the outer coastal, coastal plain as going up to Colts Neck and almost down and down to Cape May and had sandy loam soil and clay bottom and all that. And I went through the whole description. He stops me in mid sentence and he says, are you telling me this wine is from New Jersey? And I said, yes, sir. This wine is from New Jersey. I made it about 20 minutes from here. And he says, I can't believe it. So I think, I think if, you, if you take the labels and, and uh, forget about the labels and just, if all the wine fell into a swimming pool and all the labels fell off, uh, New Jersey wine would do just fine. Judging the Princeton. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's why, because, you know, you, I, when I pour for people outside the state, I don't show them the label. Right. I just, I pour them the wine and say, what do you think? You know, and they know also I have a big wine cellar. You know, I've got the Bordeaux, I got the Burgundies, you know, I got the Californians and, and I got the Oregons and, you know, you pour it for them. They love the wine and they say, where is it from? And, uh, well, it's from a winery called uh, Bellevue. It's from uh, Heritage. It's from uh, Tomasello. It's, and where are they? They're in New Jersey. You know, I, what I love doing that. And I absolutely love that. <laughs> oh, great. Well, we appreciate the uh, publicity and uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Delicious wine. Um, actually, Ashley, can you uh, do the video for Pandemonium? So, funny story is Gary and I knew of each other, but we didn't really know each other. And we happened to be at a wine conference on a historic day in Rutgers history. That's right. It was the day that there was Pandemonium in Piscataway. Those of you who know Rutgers football will know what I'm talking about. Mark Harris, the long snapper. Cali checks with Ito. He's ready. Snap. Spot. Ito puts his leg into it. And the judge has knocked it through the uprights. There is pandemonium in Piscataway. And they are going insane. Mark Harris, the long snap. I love that. I love that day. Uh, so I, I had tickets to the game. I'm, I've been a season holder for, oh, God, 25, 30 years now. I gave them to my best friend, and I went down to this wine conference in Huntsville, Maryland. Yeah. And I'm down there, so we're in the middle of the wine conference, and I leave, and I go up to this little dive bar, and I'm watching off a tiny little TV, small, half the size of this one here. Yeah. And I'm watching the game, and Gary comes up, and I said, what are you doing here? You're Mr. Big Wine. Go down with the wine people. He goes, well, I'm from Rutgers. I want to watch the game. I said, oh, I didn't know you are from Rutgers, so am I. And uh, so in Huntsville, Maryland, we met up, and we uh, since then we've been hanging out at conferences. Right. For and that was a great day to, to meet and it, to sit it, down at that bar. It, I'll tell you, it was a great game <laughs> and one of my favorites. But uh, and as Gary said before, most of the wineries in New Jersey have started in his office. Um, he, in fact, there was a uh, New Jersey Monthly came out last month, and he, they called him the man who helped put New Jersey wineries on the map, which is a Pretty high distinguished. Yeah, pretty, yeah. So he still teaches the wine appreciation class at Rutgers, right? Yeah. Are they doing that this year? Not this fall. Not this year, of course, fall, of course no. but uh, they did. And um, Gary also ran an event called the Judgment of Princeton, and I'll let him tell you about it. Well, I, I, I was there, but I, I, I didn't actually you run, but yeah. put too much of it. But you know, uh, but it did, it did come down to um, Bordeaux wines against. Uh, uh, New Jersey uh, Bordeaux blends and our Chardonnays against uh, um, Chardonnays from uh, Burgundy, France, um, and it was done blind. And uh, and you know uh, people people kind of think that uh, you know again it is France and there's you know uh, but it came out that Jersey did very well. Um, our wine scored very well. And uh, we were right there and, and realized that the Bordeaux were beating 400, 500, 600 dollar wines, you know, and ours were $25 or something, you know. So um, uh, that was really something. It really was. And, and I have done this numerous times, actually. I ran the New Jersey wine competition for over 30 years. Um, I have brought the judges together and done Bordeaux blends against Bordeaux. Chardonnays in Jersey against white burgundies. And, and the, I did it once where I kept them comparably priced, all right? Comparably priced in that around $25 range. And every single Jersey wine beat every single French wine in that tasting, every single one. So I tell people all the time, well, when's the last time you went out and bought a $500 wine? 
usually there's nobody in the room, you know? Well, that means that, you know, if you like wine 15, 20, 25, 30, you know, um, you, you're better off getting the Jersey version than the French version. And, and I've got the data to prove it, okay? So, um, but that, that tasting of Princeton made, made uh, a lot of press, yes. that's for sure. Yeah, you can look it up, it was 2012. 2012, 2012 they covered. Yeah, yeah, that was really, that was quite a tasting there. And, and, uh, and the judges were, you know, very well known, um, very, very yes. uh, certified judges and, 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 the, and the Jersey wines did fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Gary also made a prediction in the uh, New Jersey Monthly magazine that there would be 200 wineries in New Jersey. Now, you didn't give a timeline for that, though. <laughs> no. no, well, we've done the research actually showing um, the land that is suitable for, at Rutgers, the land that is suitable for grape growing in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And there's, a lot. there's no reason why we can't have 200 wineries. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, with our population, and, and I know Charlie Tomasello told me one time that, that New Jersey is the number one place in the country that, um, for people buying wine over $25. That's correct. Oh, yeah. And he told me that a long time ago. So I remember the things you tell me, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no but there's no, no reason. 200 wineries, I think, if this is 2020, God forbid there's no more COVID. But um, I think by 2030, you'll be at 100. Yeah. But 2030 will be in a hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, good to know. Because, well, other states, like I said, uh, Virginia and Texas went super hyper mode, went from 10, 20 wineries to 300, 400, 500 wineries in only a couple decades. Yeah. yeah. So, high five. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I guess we're going to go to the blueberry. Oh, all and right. I'm going to introduce Bill Heritage of William Heritage Vineyards. And uh, Penny's not with you tonight. No, uh, no. But his son, the son. Yeah, where's Rich? He's a Cook uh, graduate. Oh, Cook graduate. Took my wife. Two thousand eight, right? Took my wife. Rich, Rich has, Rich has uh, two young daughters, right. and uh, they require dad's assistance. And oh. not so much for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bill, did you fall off the table? Started off with a bang, right? Uh, <laughs> no, but. Uh, now, Rich, Rich he, he was a uh, Rutgers graduate, and uh, he had a great experience there. And, uh, you know, he brought his marketing back to the family farm, which was in dire need of marketing assistance. Yes. Um, you know, we can grow fruit and uh, grapes and, and make wine, but if you can't market it, you can't sell it, you know, that's, that's, that's a real problem. So uh, he's been a great, uh, great asset to the, to the family uh, business for that. Okay. All that from Rutgers. So it's been great. Now, Heritage Winery has a short history, not as long as uh, Renault right. or Tomasello, but I know yeah. you first planted your grapes in uh, 1997. Uh, I think it was Chardonnay and Cab Franc, and did very yeah, we well. To, uh, yeah, we went to a uh, we went to a. And this involves Gary again. Here we go. Right, um, Gary and, and another gentleman uh, did a, um, a uh, at a conference at a meeting. And uh, we decided to attend it, just be curious. And uh, Gary said uh, to me, he says, so what do you grow, Bill? I said, peaches and apples. He says, perfect. I said, perfect what? He said, that's exactly what it takes to grow wine grapes. And I said, what do you mean? He says, where every vineyard in France has a small orchard. And I said, okay. So we decided to plant an, an acre of each, Chardonnay and, and Cab Franc, because they were the most uh, cold hardy. And just recently, I got a chance to go to France, and sure enough, they all had a small orchard. Those guys did over there. So, uh, kudos to you, Gary, for that one. That was a good one. Good call. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the reason is the reasoning is that apples need a long season, right? So, yep. um, just just like the grapes, they need well-drained soils. Um, Correct. Peaches peaches are susceptible to cold, and they are susceptible yep. to cold yeah. about the same level that vinifera grapes are. And they're very also much so. susceptible to frost. And so, yep. uh, so they're very like, if you have a long history of, of apples and peaches on a place, I, I told Bill, I don't need to see his property. I know he can grow vinifera. There it is. Yeah, and, and you know your property. So there's always highs and lows. You know, there's mm -hmm. frost pockets no matter where you are. Uh, like Charlie said, Sandy Loam is the ideal, you know, soils for, 
for these varieties that we're growing and also uh, so we're talking about all these different varieties but here we have the Jersey blue so uh, long story short when we started the wine uh, process back in uh, 1997 99 started making one in 2000 um, we had people picking up our wine but some people weren't picking it up and one day I stopped him I said hey you didn't like the wine he said no I have a sweet palate I have a sweet I like sweet wines so I said okay so Penny and I conferenced and we said, we have all this fruit. Why don't we just make some fruit wine and make it sweet? And that was the, that was one of the best things we ever did. So uh, we developed the Jersey brand, which is, uh, we want to differentiate from our estate uh, uh, vinifera. And um, we developed the Jersey brand and Rich, Rich uh, ran with that, you know, and developed, he does all the design of the label and all. And, um, and now we're uh, distributing it in 500 different locations in the state of New Jersey through a distributor. And um, it's, a, it's a great way to, to get people that drink the sweet tea first before you get to the black coffee. And the black coffee for me is the dry, dry reds and dry whites. So right, right. Uh, I think it's a, natural, it's a natural way to get into the wine game. And, you, and blueberry is a Sam Dunn for, uh, for, for New Jersey. South Jersey. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Hamilton, you know, it's the uh, self-proclaimed capital of the world for blueberry production and all. It's just a, it's a natural uh, Jersey uh, brand. So as the poster show, we have other, we have other varieties. You know, we do apple and peach and, and some other things. So uh, it's, just, it's just a great way to, to get started in the, uh, into the wine game. Yeah, but I, I would also mention that even people who drink dry wine, all right, I mean, you really don't drink dry wine with dessert, okay? Mm -hmm. So, right. I mean, with this right. wine with cheesecake is incredible. Oh, perfect. I mean, it is incredible. Perfect. So the thing is, you know, if you're drinking, you know, the, uh, the Pinot Grigio with the salad and the Cabernet with, with Charlie's lamb chop, okay, that's yep. fine. But, but if you've got cheesecake, you know, I would like to open this bottle. This yes. is what I'm going to open. So, I, so yeah. even dry people should realize that, that matching a sweet wine, some of the greatest wines in the world are sweet wine. This wine, the greatest wine in the world, right? Oh my God! It's, yep. Yeah. So, so it's 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 a, it's a whole gamut, you know, from dry to, mm -hmm. to sweet and and uh, in between, and uh, you know, we uh, it's, it's been a real uh, and it gets like I said, it gets people into the game. It, people that are in the game can enjoy it with different foods. And for me, food and wine is a necessity. It's not just about the wine. It's pairing foods with the wine that really enhances the experience. And uh, oh. um, you know. So. Yeah. And you, you know, something I always thought was funny that uh, with Jersey, with New Jersey, of all the states that are new states, Jersey yeah. is the only one you can say and identify it. You can't do that with any others. You can't do that with New right. Mexico, or right. New York, or right. any place else. I just thought we, that was funny. We went, we went down that road with the with the uh, TTB and all. So uh, yeah, it's been, it's all been documented. It's all good. So. Mm -hmm. yep. The other thing, actually, I have in the other room, I have some chocolate hummus, and I think that would go incredible with this, or any, think, anything yeah. chocolate, basically. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Would be so, yeah. Uh, in fact, actually, Bill, uh, about ooh, probably about two or three weeks ago, I opened up one of your uh, BDXs. Uh, okay. Bill makes a, a William Heritage Winery makes a Bordeaux style called BDX, and uh, from 2013, and it was stellar. Uh, like, Thank like you. I was saying. It could compare to some of the Bordeaux's. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the first roast, but maybe a second or yeah, third. Yeah, but I, I'm fine with that. I have no problem with that. <laughs> and you know, our passion is our good. passion is to dry is to dry Bordeaux uh, vinifers uh, grapes, and uh, we have a. If you go to our website, we have a full gamut of. We start with sparkling, and we we go into uh, Sauvignon Blanc and uh, Viognier and Pinot Gris and uh, rosés. You know, <laughs> different rosés we're doing, and 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 the dry. Um, dry reds all, you know, uh, whether it's Rhone or, or Bordeaux varietals. So uh, uh, please uh, encourage you to visit the site. There's a lot more information there that I can tell you tonight. That Well, uh, Bill, for one thing, you, you, I think you've got to mention the fact that you've gone um, really more towards organic now. Uh, um, we, we, have, we have experimented with that. Uh, our our um, Original winemaker Sean Caminos was with us for 12 years. He uh, he left the uh, company here to go west to Oregon, uh, and uh, we've uh, now got a, a new winemaker, uh, Kevin. Uh, he comes from a, a long history of uh, making wine throughout the, the world. So uh, 
we're excited about to see what he's going to bring to the table. So, uh, so far, so good. So, um, you know, as it goes on, you know, here the adventure continues. But in the vineyard, you're you're, you're going more towards the organic way. I mean, you're oh you're, yeah, uh, yeah. You stopped using herbicides and you know things we're, like that. We're trying to eliminate herbicides. We're planting today. I was the last two days. All I've been doing is planting cover crop. You know, uh, and trying to keep, you know get it in the ground and. Uh, and uh, all those things. So uh, it's, that's, a, that's a, a neat way of uh, continuing it also. So uh, hopefully that'll bring some new uh, nuances to the wines. And um, exactly. uh, so far it's been very successful. So uh, we're, we're gonna keep yeah. doing it. Well, uh, and again, Her William Herridge's wines have won multiple awards. Uh, it, uh, the Blueberry won the Governor's Cup at the Garden State yeah. Wine Challenge. Uh, you have the best white with your Jersey white, which is uh, Riesling, Chenin Blanc, and Muscat. Uh, you also won the best fruit with the uh, Jersey peach, a double gold. Yep. Uh, best dessert with the late harvest Simeon in 2019. And But the big story is the uh, William Heritage Brut, Sparkling Brut. Yes. That won the best of show uh, in 2019. Tell us the story of uh, how you came up with the uh, Sparkling. Well, I'm a, like Charlie said, uh, I'm a Pinot's, you know, everybody's in love with Pinot. It could be your worst nightmare or it could be your best friend, depending on the day. And uh, it was our worst nightmare until one day we decided that uh, we were going to try to make sparkling from it. And uh, it was picked early. We had time in the, in the winery to, to try it. And uh, we did. And um, we haven't looked back since. It's been, a, it's been a, a great way to get things started and another item to put on the shelf and another... I mean, who knew, you know, um, it's just, we're, you know, we're continuing to in investigate and, and learn more about it as we go along. And, uh, uh, so, um, you know, stay tuned. There's a lot more to come for that. So. Yeah. And that is really in a French style, um, a French champagne yeah. style. I mean, I, I have, I have some, and I hate to say snooty friends, but, but yeah. I have friends, that, but, uh, uh, and Charlie's shaking his head. He knows these people, <laughs> and, so, yep. and yep. and you know we we do champagnes, and uh, we we've, we've tasted your sparkling right along with oh, with the best uh, champagnes, um, Verclico and Bollinger, et cetera. And and uh, it doesn't take a backseat to, to order any of them. It's really really a beautiful wine. Thank you very much. We we we're just we're thrilled with it, and we we hope that it continues to be you know. A, a good product for us, which so far. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Simeon just won the Governor's Cup for best dessert wine in New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. You don't hear Simeon. Simeon doesn't come up much in the New Jersey circle, but I think it might be one of those varieties. You guys were talking about it earlier, a variety or trend. You know, Simeon really has a thicker skin. It's a little tougher for our environment here. Uh, it is a Bordeaux, a white variety. So uh, might be something that uh, New Jersey might think about um you know adding to the plate you know of possible uh you know wines in new jersey so stay tuned for that okay and uh the other blueberry for those of you who got the tomasello package we're gonna pour that next charlie any words on your blueberry i know you also um, make a sparkling blueberry and a blueberry oh, pour. we do we make uh well we live in uh hamilton and uh we have a statutory requirement to make blueberry wine and blueberry <laughs> sparkling wine and blueberry port and blueberry moscato and just there about anything, any other blueberry that you can come up with. But uh, we've been making blueberry a very long time. I, I, um, you know, my original uh, foray into fruit wines was to make a raspberry wine because uh, Tom Sharko at Alba made such a good raspberry wine and I'd had customers coming in asking for raspberry wine. So I, uh, I made raspberry wine. It did pretty well. And then one day our former uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Art Brown, came into the winery in Hamilton and he's tasting oh, yeah. my raspberry wine. He said, Charlie, where's your blueberry wine? I said, I don't make blueberry wine. He says, you live in Hamilton. You have to make blueberry wine. So uh, from that point on, uh, the next year we made some and it's it's been going real well. I will, I will tell you that um, we sell our fruit wines in 21 states and uh, with a great deal of success and in New Jersey. 
And um, the, the thing about, about free wines that's different than, than some of the other challenges that we face is nobody, there is no geographical bias with fruit wines. Uh, nobody says, is this a New Jersey blueberry wine or is this a mm -hmm. California blueberry wine? They just say, oh, this is nice blueberry wine. So I think uh, if you're looking for a way to uh, escape the state border uh, and get your wines around, uh, you probably have a pretty good chance with fruit wine. Much more so, I think, than the uh, inverse relationship with some of the um, of the uh you know your specific varietal wines from your region so and, like and john this wine this wine cracked the, the uh in japan too right it's made big big time yeah in japan. we uh we had a very pleasant experience in japan a number of years ago we uh we were at a trade show uh actually art brown went to a trade show in chicago and asked us to donate some blueberry wine and I thought, here we go, more free wine. So I gave uh, Art <laughs> a couple of cases and uh, six months, a year passed and never heard a word. And then all of a sudden out of the blue on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock, we get a call from Tokyo from uh, the ATO, the Agricultural Trade Officer for the US government asking if we could sell blueberry wine in Japan. And we all had a, a really nice laugh because uh, how do you sell blue, you know, how do you sell wine 8,000 miles away? So mm -hmm. about 10,000 emails later, uh, we actually <laughs> sold, uh, we ended up selling five containers and it, it went very well. And it was very popular there because of the antioxidant right. aspect right. of the product. You know, it was viewed as a, right. as a and um, it, it went well for a long time. It, Japan is very fad oriented, so it eventually faded, but it was it was fun. Um, it was a real challenge uh, scurrying around in non-blueberry season, finding enough blueberries to fill five containers worth. But uh, it it was a fun experience. So I remember your brother saying, Jack, was saying that they would put it over ice with a twist of lemon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't often talk about the many uses of blueberry wine in Japan. But, uh, <laughs> It is what it is, you know. It doesn't matter as long as you got it sold. That's all. <laughs> it, it, it went. It went very well. We we sold some of the other Pacific Rim countries, Taiwan and South Korea, and uh, and uh, to Hong Kong, etc. On on fruit wines, they're they're well received and and right, right. Uh, they fit a particular niche, you know. As and as Bill said accurately, you know, it's it's not always about the dry wine. There's a sweet palate and. Uh, and right. we, we sell a lot of sweeter wines and that's that to a you know pretty receptive audience so right you know what i do with this is i uh i put, make a creme brulee i put blueberries in the creme brulee and then match it with your blueberry wine mm -hmm. oh thank and, you that's very nice oh my god yeah. <laughs> i think bill bill you know the cheesecake is a great use too as as uh yeah as bill Herod has suggested it doesn't it doesn't go badly with a little vodka either <laughs> that's true it does yeah. go very well with it actually you can make a nice vodka in your cosmetic that's right um hey scott i had a question for you uh biggest challenges of a new jersey winemaker well i mean certainly it can be the elements uh sometimes here in, in new jersey we have these heavy rains that really uh are very tough for us to handle here in the state. You know, you think about uh, established grape growing regions and generally they're very dry areas, more arid, you know, you think California um, or, you know, Italy or Macedonia around that area. Um, so that would be, I think, number one for us is our humidity, our rainfall, um, and then just years like 2020 where everything is gonna hit us at once. You know, we, we have a climate where uh, we can get to freezing temperatures in the winter, you know, below zero. And in the summertime, we can get uh, above 100. So, you know, making wine in the Northeast is uh, is, is tricky at times. Okay. Well, good. Well, um, anything else uh, you want to say? I had some other uh, couple things I wanted to mention. First of all, uh, I just want to give a uh, RIP for uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a law professor at Rutgers. Yeah. And uh, she fought, and she was the, one of the first people to really fight hard for women's rights. And uh, rest in peace to her. Uh, I hope everybody is excited about Rutgers football because we will be coming back on October 24th versus Michigan State. In fact, 
Gary and I are very, very excited. Very excited. And very excited, excited for Greg Schiano to be back and for Rutgers football to be doing well. Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen this year, but after the last three years, uh, it's got to be better than that. Yes, right. So, got to be better than that. Right. Uh, I also wanted to mention um, the American Wine Society. Uh, we, as I said, we're the oldest and largest uh, consumer educational wine organization in the United States. We have chapters all over the country. Um, our 2020 conference has been canceled this year in Seattle, but the cool thing is that 2021 conference is scheduled for Atlantic City at right. Harrah's, where we'll have either probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 wine enthusiasts there, and it will be one of the biggest parties of the year. We usually bring about 20,000 bottles of wine there, and we're going to have a showcase, hopefully in the uh, Harris Pool area, of uh, New Jersey wines. Absolutely. Um, that's going to be October 30th to November 2nd, 2021. And I would point out that wherever you are in the United States, there probably are chapters in the American Wine Society. And, and so if you want to learn more about wine, if you want to taste more, more wine, um, you should really check out and go on just AmericanWineSociety.org. Uh, I'm actually a, a, a past national president, president yes. and um, so it's it's a great society. It's it's not a money making thing at all. It's about it's about education, and it was actually started by uh, Constantine Frank up in the Finger Lakes in 1962. Yes. So um, you know it's a great it's a great organization. Um, so we're we're looking forward to this uh, conference in New Jersey. Uh, it's going to be fun. The next, last time we had a conference in New Jersey was 1999. 1999. That's in right. New Brunswick, in New Brunswick at the right. Hyatt. Right. Uh, but it was much smaller than a thousand people. So that was. They had about the six seven hundred. Six seven hundred. Yeah. You got two questions. I have two questions. Today. Christine wants to know how the flavor wheel works. Oh, the flavor wheel. Um, well, the, the, yeah. The, the flavor wheel. What you do is, you know, it is supposed to help you. The question is about the flavor wheel. Um, flavor wheel, you're supposed to, it, it helps you um, with one of the five S's. It helps you with sniff, all right? A, 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 lot, a lot of people have a hard time um, putting a word to what they're smelling, all right? So with that flavor wheel, you can, you look at the centerpiece, all right, the center of it, all right? And, and then you work out from it. So if you say, well, that's fruity, okay, so that's fruit. Well, then you work out the fruit. What kind of fruit? You know, is it apples, peaches, this kind of thing? Then you go out further. So you start in the center of the, of the flavor and you and you move out. And it just helps your mind kind of put a name to the the uh, the aromas that you get. Okay. And and after a while, when you do this, um, you'll 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 learn more about the the terminology of, of wine about you know the things the words that we use so that what you, when you read a review of a wine and wine spectator or for instance the new york times on wednesday eric Asinoff uh, uh, writes a, writes an article you know when he's describing the wines he's using words that maybe you don't aren't, aren't used to and this flavor wheel actually starts you being able to train yourself to to the aromas and that's what the, that aroma wheel is for right uh, actually, the American Wine Society has a program. It's called the Wine Judge uh, Training Program or Certification Program, and it's a couple-year program. And you, if you do it, you become a certified wine judge, and you actually get paid to drink wine. Not a bad deal. Right. In fact, everybody asks me. They say, "Oh, what's the best thing about being a certified wine judge?" Well, two things. Number one, practice. That's a great thing. And then the other thing it helps with is when the kids go. Um, Hey, Daddy, I need uh, help with homework, or I need you to drive me to my friends. I go, sorry, kids, I'm working. I'm working, yes, right, I'm working. Yeah. 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 So I, I went through that program, and uh, so, yeah, I am a certified one judge. Uh, Ashley, can you show the picture of Rutgers versus Harvard? Now, uh, yeah, a lot of things have changed, uh, obviously, with COVID, when wine tastings going virtual and not even uh, being to able to visit wineries at all. So, but hopefully that will change. So I just had a quick picture I just wanted to show you guys. See, it wasn't Harvard or Yale that came up with a better COVID test. It was a public university from New Jersey. <laughs> so just know, remember that. Um, and since the uh, COVID situation, there's been more wine sold from liquor stores and uh, online. However, restaurants have taken a huge hit. So total sales of wine is actually down uh, during the COVID period. But liquor sales and uh, online is up. I just thought that was interesting. 
And uh, now pour another glass of your favorite wine or all of the wines and enjoy it. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it was a good time. I'm glad we did it. It's our first one. So hopefully we'll be able to do this again. I uh, appreciate the panelists. They did a great job and, and had some wonderful wines. Uh, and I hope everybody had a good time and uh, looking forward to doing this again. Any uh, last words, Gary? Well, remember the five S's, right? That's, that's really how I think you can learn to enjoy the wine. And wherever you live, check those wines out, okay? Because there's great wine being made everywhere. And, and I got to tell you, all the wineries, as Dan said, that, you know, they're hurting right now. You can't go into the tasting rooms and all that stuff. So, you know, uh, I, would, I would really uh, uh, try to uh, support these wineries wherever you are in the state. Um, whatever state you're in, because they, they really need you right now, as does restaurants. So um, in this tough time, it's, uh, we, we got to really reach out to the people that are really having a tough time. You know? So I leave you with that. Yeah, and I, I just want to remind our friends that are from, are from New Jersey or went to school at Rutgers and moved away, of all the things I wanted to remind you that you're missing here. You know, whether it's a Taylor ham or a pork roll, and by the way, Merlot per, uh, goes perfect with Taylor ham. <laughs> uh, you're missing New Jersey having the highest cost of living. Auto insurance, property taxes, business taxes, gas taxes, but we pump our own gas. Yeah. And that's fun. <laughs> we are the world leaders in both blueberry and cranberry production. We had actually the first American brewery was in New Jersey, in Hoboken, 1642, as well as the first baseball game in Hoboken and the first intercollegiate college football game, which was Rutgers versus Princeton. Um, you're missing all the great pizza and great bagels and, that are fresh here. Uh, you miss going down the shore. You miss uh, traffic circles and jug handles, I hope not, and fat sandwiches, bullies, and cluck you, and along with Snooky and the cast of the Jersey Shark. But thank you very much for joining us. I hope everybody had a good time. We're going to stay online, fill up that glass, ask us some questions. We're here for a couple minutes, so. And you know, Jackie Robinson played in Jersey City. He did? Yeah. Yep, so, and... Uh, this is this is the baseball playoff. So, you know, do we have any other questions? All right. Charlie, I'm going to go back to that Palmaris cab. I got to tell you, I've got a little bit of salami left here. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. Thank you, John. You need a glass? I'm all right now. You're good. Good. Okay. All right. Well, I don't see any uh, questions, so I guess I'll uh, call it quits. Okay. All right, guys. Hey, thank, thank you, you all. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Take your time. Thanks, Gary. Thank Thanks, you, John. Came in. Thanks, Danny. Hey. No problem. Oh, oh, we have one question. The New Jersey environment is ideal for which type of wine? Oh, that shut down. That yeah, that could be uh, a <laughs> could be an hour conversation in itself. <laughs> so depending where you are in New Jersey and what you're doing in New Jersey, right? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks. Have a good night.